And uh, this hour, we're going to be talking with Adelaide-born Pete Gavron, who has been uh, a huge player in the food scene in the South Island uh, in the last... Uh well, many, many years, and I'm really looking forward to this chat. Uh, we're going to also talk to him about uh, a story that um, that popped up this morning uh, in the ODT. It's a fascinating one, and it sort of basically infers that even someone <laughs> as qualified as Gordon Ramsay might not meet the criteria to come and work as a chef in New Zealand under these new accredited employer work visa uh, thingies, uh, for want of a better word. So... Um, that is interesting, isn't it? Uh, looking forward to talking to Pete. I think he might be on the line right now, actually. G'day there, Pete. How are you? Hey, hi, Leanne. Hello. Great. How are you? Hello. Very good. Hello. Uh, hello, hello. And yes. we've been wanting to make this happen for a while, so I'm very, very pleased that we finally got you uh, on for this chat. And, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I forget that you're from, you're from Adelaide and you did all your foodie training in Australia and, and you had a pretty high profile there. And then you came to Arrowtown and, yeah, things went crazy. A couple of books and a great restaurant. Uh, and I don't know where to begin, actually, with your, with your background. But wh- why don't you tell us what you're up to at the moment? Um, yeah, before I came to a- uh, Arrowtown, actually, before I, I landed at... Um, at Arrowtown about 20 years ago, I opened a little place. I came over skiing with a bunch of friends and we were, we were um, in Queenstown late one night and we were sort of wondering what we could do for a, a bite to eat. And um, I just sort of saw an opportunity. So I, we sort of resettled with our two gorgeous little kids and over here and we opened a whole, we being Melanie and myself and my partner, and we opened mm. a a hole in the wall, which was sort of like a 24-hour thing. And this is before there were any other real 24-hour things um, going on in town. And that was great. And it gave us, it was really busy. And and it was a lot of fun. And I got to meet a lot of people. And it, it sort of, that was a platform um, to, you know, um, to uh, open in, ultimately open in our town. Mm. What was but, the name um, of that um, business, Pete? It was called the Jazz Bar. And there had been... There had been about three or four different owners. It was sort of like a, a concept place, but it was very much in the, in the sort of previous sort of, um, you know, shops. It, they, were, they were just, it was sort of pies and late night stuff, you know. And what made it different when, when I took it over was that we wanted to introduce fresh food late at night that was cooked to order, you know, so you could have a curry or a stir fry or or whatever, but it was, it was real food as opposed to something in a packet. The know? curries um, were great. I remember them. I, yes, I remember you coming in met all those all those years ago. But it was it was a delight, and it was cool to see. I mean, it was it was just totally, it was totally unpretentious as far as there was no. I mean, it was just a lean to sort of situation. But it was you know it wasn't a formal sort of vibe at all. People just came in, ate, had a chat, and it was often three in the morning, so the chats got pretty out of control. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. often we'd have those bars like Chico's and all those late night bars this is before the sort of early closing thing came in even and people would stumble out but it was it was it was different then too because it was a smaller place and it was definitely more a sense of a community we didn't have as many international travelers so it was sort of it had a i mean the whole town felt a little bit more like a club i think in those days um Mm -hmm. it was a little bit more connectivity you know and it's grown you can't stop progress and because it is just such an extraordinarily beautiful place and you know it's just so unique yeah, um, that's right. You know, it was just inevitable that it was going to catch on to the rest of the world, wasn't it? You know? Yeah, I, I just wish that we had the jazz bar now because um, it was healthy food and it was, you know, it was it was really good, wholesome food and it was just what you know because when you often you know if you go to those burger places you feel worse the next day. So if you have been out on the tiles, as it were, uh, going to jazz bar was great because it, um, well, it sobered you up and <laughs> you had these um, you I mean, had really good that, food. Yeah, and really good chat. I mean, it was. You just you'd see people just engaging, and I like that part of it. I mean, that's I mean, it's I guess all restaurants have that you know component. I remember when we had Saffron. One of the great things about the place was you'd have nights where just random strangers would all engage and get to know each other. By the end of the night, it, it, tables were just talking across tables, and it just felt like a dinner party vibe, you know. Well, and, that, and that's I, true. I distinctly remember getting, and that didn't happen every night, but when it did, I just distinctly remember thinking to myself, "This is it. This is what this is all about." You know, it's you know, creating a place where people can come and eat and drink and relax and feel like, you know, I never really embraced the whole sort of starch linen tablecloth thing and all of that because 
I wanted it to have a sense of informality. I wanted it to have a sense of comfortability, like a good pair of slippers, you know? Mm. Like sitting by the fire and having a wine at home with your pals, that sort of vibe was what I aspired to. I didn't was never really into, you know, the formal thing, you know, of people, you know, like the, the being greeted by the maitre d' with the, you know, the iron shirt kind of vibe, you know. And that's great. There's a place for that mm. all day long. Man, people like that. And on occasion, I do that too, but... It wasn't the sort of place that I wanted to front represent, you know? Mm -hmm. What I love too is like uh, you and Mel... Uh, your partner, like people, we knew you on a first name basis and you seemed, gen you know, both of you were genu genuinely interested in, in your customers and you're right, it was kind of, I don't know, it, it had a very different vibe to anything and, and then of course you went out to, on to, to put out the book on Saffron which was really beautiful, a, a beautiful book. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember Random House flew us up. They said, you're interested in doing a book? And we thought, this was Nicola Leggett, who was the, she used to be the editor of the Metro magazine. She took over the random before they mer merged with Penguin. She was just an extraordinary human being, really lovely person, the delight to work with. And she approached us and said, are you, you know, interested in doing a book? And I thought, I hadn't really considered that. So we, they flew us up to Auckland. We had a sort of roundtable meeting with the people that do the production. And all, you know, it's a big company. So, you know, they have, you know, lots of different people that specialise in different components of publishing a book. And it was a world unknown to me. You know, I had no place. And then I, and I thought, it sounds like a lot of work. And, and Nicholas said, yeah, that this will change your life. If for no other reason, it gives you the opportunity to leave a legacy behind. You know, if you have mm. grandkids, they, you know, that sort of thing. And I hadn't mm -hmm. even hadn't considered that. And I thought, well, you know, it was a... I felt an enormous sense of responsibility too to try and get it right to, yeah. you know, to showcase the region we, you know, this incredible region that we worked in. And then, I mean, that was sort of close to 20 years ago when the wine industry hadn't evolved as much as it has now. Mm. But you could see where it was going, and and there's always been that relationship, that beautiful hand little glove relationship. And I saw it in Adelaide because we have great wineries there too in the Barossa Valley, you know. But right. if you are in the on the periphery of that. You know, the, you know, as, as being a restaurateur, then you get the opportunity. You get this sort of lovely osmosis between the, you know, the guys making the wine and the guys making the food. And you know, it definitely is a hand in glove sort of vibe. And you know, I always I have so much admiration for the winemakers because I sort of go, well, you know, you know, as a chef proprietor, you know, you, you're pretty much as good as your last meal. But you, you, you know, you're making, you might be making fifty or hundred meals a day. You know, you just it's quick turnover. You just you know, you're creating something and you're just serving it and you're just hoping it's great. But, yeah. you know, but it, one dish, it's one dish amongst, so, you know, uh, you know, every however many is not going to be perfect. I mean, it's just, we're not perfect. It's not, you know, it's human nature that you're going to drop the ball a little bit. But with winemakers, uh -huh. they get a shot of it. You know, they're making their beer, how many tens of thousands of litres of wine. They get one shot at that. And if they get it wrong, they've got to wear that for the whole year, you know. And Good point. So I think that... Guy, you know they 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 work under so much pressure, but here we are. We've got the likes of like Alan Brady, who everyone said back in the day, "You're wasting your time. It's not going to happen." I mean, he was the grandfather of the industry. Hey, you know, that's he, right. He he, he he put it all on the line and went, "Nah, it's going to work." And he had the faith and also the technical ability to pull it off. And I mean, he cut that track. And it's really easy for the people to come in down the road and go, yeah, well, Central makes great wine, let's go to a winery, and off they went, you know. Mm. But it took enormous courage for a guy like that, you know, for anyone to do it. And he did it, and, and he did it with just such great humility. And, you know, he's just that sort of the most understated, you know, like, you know, humble but incredibly gifted guy. And, well, yeah. and he basically set the industry up for, for everyone else that's followed. Exactly. That created and, the template. And, you know, would saffron have been, um, I mean, it was wonderful. I remember the trio of curries. What a great dish that was. <laughs> oh, I miss, I still, I mean, well, my partner misses that actually. I th it was very much a, I think it was a real boy <laughs> go to, the trio of curries, you know? How could he go yeah, wrong? I the moment, Philip. The, the moment you and Philip walked in, I already knew I got the pan. I knew, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well worn track. But would it have, were you about to say, would it have been flourished in the same way if it wasn't for the wine industry? Probably not, you know. Um, that was my point, uh, yes. Yeah, no, it, would it have gone? Well, I mean, you know, I wouldn't, I, I don't suspect it would have changed the way I cooked, but, you know, people come to the region now for the food and wine experience. So you take the wine out of the equation, that's half of. You know, half of the, the the sort of you know the the motivation gone there, isn't it? You mm. know? Um, half the magic gone. 
Totally. I mean, and it, and it also, you know, the way you drive into Queenstown, so if you're coming in, if you're coming in overland from Cromwell, you know, like that, it's sort of like the entry gate is other vineyards on either side, you know, and you, you see that. So it sort of, yeah, it creates a certain mood for anyone that's coming to dine anyway. I, I, I think you know, so. I, and I was talking it, you to a friend of mine the other day, the winemaker down here, and I said, you know, like what you're creating, I mean, you look at the vineyards, the great vineyards in Bordeaux and Burgundy in, in France, and, you know, you know, they're, they're intergenerational. They're, you know, a lot of those have been built hundreds of, well, created hundreds of years ago. So these guys are creating sort of, you know, these legacies for their, you know, forever takes them, you know, takes them over. And they'll only get better. Mm. I, I remember Alan Brady saying to me, you know, back in the early days when we opened Saffron, a lot of the, the Pinots just didn't last that long in the bottle. And he explained to me that the vines need to have some age for the wines that they make to actually have longevity in the bottle. Yeah, and you can see that happening now. You know, you know, you know, the wines just sell for longer now, and mm. I, I suspect that's only going to increase. Mm, I'd say so, Pete. You, you, not you, anything last that long in my cellar. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you're a chef after all, and chefs have a reputation well, yeah, to no. uphold, don't they? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, totally, yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, so Pete, you've you've travelled a bit this year, and I was really fascinated because you you said you went to Morocco. Do you want to tell us a little bit about some of your food discoveries there? Oh yeah. Okay. Um. Firstly, traveling again was just, I, you know, I got to the airport and, the, and I, for a moment, you know, and I'm not, I don't think anyone ever described me as a drink of but I got nervous, you know, I thought, wow, I've got to go through Dubai and, you know, Casablanca and to get there, multiple stops, you know, it's almost 20 hours of wearing a mask. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, and that whole thing. And there was definitely this vibe of apprehension, you know, well, that I, that I was feeling anyway. Anyway, got to Morocco. And no one seemed to be concerned about it that much. But the restaurant that I went to, a place that I'd worked at some years ago through New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, you know, government body in those days had sort of organised a what they call a stage, which is when you work as a chef for a short period of time in a restaurant to, you know, to sort of garner some experience and understanding about a type of cuisine. Yep. You know, because mm-hmm. I had a guy who was like the biggest buyer of New Zealand kiwi fruit come into the restaurant once with these the trade delegation, you know, and he said, well, you don't have any tagines on the menu? I said, well, I don't want to <laughs> put anything on like that that's so specific to your country and misrepresent it. And I've never been to Morocco. Mm. Um, this is, you know, 18 years ago. Something. And he said, well, are you going to Europe anytime soon? And as a matter of fact, I booked a ticket to London to work at a restaurant there as well. And he said, well, come, I've, my, my friend owns the best restaurant in, uh, you know, in Marrakesh. I could organise you, you know, to to do a stint there. And I went, well, well, that's a golden opportunity. So I took him up. And Isn't I it? worked in this place called Mohards, which was just amazing and near the main sort of market in, in Marrakesh. And this guy had a reputation for being the, um, you know, for one of the best, he had a reputation for being one of the best chefs in the country. So he just taught me stuff. You know, he taught me how to make tagines. He was from the Berber tribe. So he, you know, he sort of showed me tagines that were unique to his tribe and extraordinarily i found that out that the women from the berber tribe have was something like a moku they were, they have a tattoo on their chin oh they do and i thought that was extraordinary like this cross-cultural sort of thing you know like we have that in in our country here and and similarly they have something but they have it for i believe a different reason and he said um that it's impolite to ask a berber woman if she's married so the the, the tattoo on their chin denotes firstly that they are married and and there are eight different sorts of tattoos. Each one represents a different tribe that they're a member of. That's so you fascinating. So you married and you know what tribe they're from. So that was extraordinary. But when I Isn't left, it? his Mohard's mother was a potter, and uh, and she made me. And I'm looking at one right now. She made me a series of tagines, each with the different moku that represented the different one of the different sub tribes. And I brought them back as hand luggage, mm. used them in the restaurant, and these things are just so extraordinarily tough and resilient. Yeah. I mean, you know, a tagine is just a clay pot with a yeah. lid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I use these countless times in the restaurant. use them every night in the restaurant. I've used them at home and touch wood, and this mm. is like 18 years later. I've never broke that one. They're still broke. going strong. Absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? You know, to have pottery last that long under like commercial, you know, situation. <sighs> yeah, crazy. There, you know, there's some there's some magic in how they make their tagines in Morocco. I, I reckon. Know. I love tagines. Oh, I think oh, they're one of my favourite dishes ever. Oh, they're just you know superb. the thing about the, 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 the spices they use because you know, tagine, I mean, they they vary depending on the dish, but the common sort of 
ingredients are often cinnamon, um, cardamom, clove, nutmeg, uh, and saffron and or turmeric. But the, mm. but these are ingredients that are all very common in Indian style curries. And if you look at the trade routes, you can see like the osmosis between, you know, the Indian cuisines and the, and, you know, the stuff in Africa. And they did used to, you know, like they, they traded a lot there. And it's interesting to see how the, the sort of the preferences for spice mix is sort of has traveled across the oceans like that, you know. Oh, it's, it's great. But when you even just talking about those spices, I mean, don't they work together so, so amazingly well? I mean, no wonder the dishes are, are just uh, divine. But the way they sort of develop, like uh, the tagine is effectively a little oven. So, you know, that's the whole purpose of having that sort of, that, that, you know, that lid and that shape that you sort of, they heat it from underneath and so the heat's trapped and so it tenderizes things as it cooks them because oh, it has yeah. provides more heat than, you, you know, you, you would normally have in a pot. Yeah. Amazing little bit of culinary evolution that, eh? Yeah, so, so amazing. So when you went to, so you, you worked in Morocco in the past and then you went back this year again. Yeah, but Big Bummer, the guy who was the, <laughs> when I got there, the yeah. guy who was the maitre d in the restaurant at Force Nine, had just died of COVID. So, oh, um, what? yeah, so that put a bit oh. of a damper on that. But anyway, what what was really interesting between when I I thought from a, like a cooking point of view, the difference in the cuisine, the way the cuisine had sort of evolved. Like back in the day when I first went over there the best restaurants in Marrakesh were, it was all quite formal. They all had a common theme and that's, you'd walk into these restaurants and they had, you know, uh, you know, like the big sort of cushions and bolsters everywhere. You had, mm. mid, you had so magicians, you had musicians <laughs> playing traditional Moroccan instruments mm. and it was very old worldy. You walked in and there was, you know, like all the waiters had fezzes on and oh, that sort of vibe. Just killer know, atmosphere, right? Like just so good. Like Casablanca, you know, yeah, yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. you know, the, Bogey movie, you know, all of that, right? But now what had happened, what I, what I found out a couple of months ago, is that the whole vibe has changed and what's happening now is they've gone for rooftop bars. Like a lot of those old traditionally well-regarded restaurants have now opened up like, you know, restaurant-like kind of vibe. They've, got, they've opened places on the rooftops because a lot of flat roofs up in, in Marrakesh uh -huh. and, they, and they've, they've got lots of planters and plants and these sprinkler systems that just missed out into the crowd, and they're all playing. Lit, and it was extraordinary. They're playing like Arabic sort of Afro sort of housey music. Yeah, you know they've got DJs, and they're, 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 it's just extraordinary. I wish I'd tape some of it. Yeah, but I'd love to see, of, see and hear that. Oh, you, but you get what I'm talking about. You know, mm -hmm. it's, that, it's that sort of Afro, but but sort of but house vibe music, and and it's become much more casual. It's it's sort of like small plates. I mean, they all have a tagine on, but instead of it just being heavy with tagines, mm. it's it's lots of small plates, sort of like the like a, a Arabic version of tapas. Yeah, gorgeous. You know? Yeah, and what that's a... the type. That's the direction the cuisine's gone in. It's all young people out there now hanging out and doing that. And, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 taken a sea change, and up for the better. I thought it felt great. Yeah, I, I can I totally get that. It's a it's a nice it's a nice way to eat, isn't it? That type of style. But imagine doing that in Morocco. Oh, Pete, it must have been it must have been sensational after these last three years to be in such a vibrant, uh, colourful, and cultural place. Yeah, uh, yeah, travel's good for the soul, isn't it? You know, oh, and I mean, yeah. I used to go yeah. when I had the when I had the restaurants annually because i mean everyone loves a holiday but there was a real you know there was there was a real practical component to that because as beautiful i mean look you know having a restaurant in, in our town is just the dream place because you're surrounded by mountains it's paradise the people are cool the neighborhood's awesome all of that no crime to speak of all the good stuff you know it's a beautiful you know you get beautiful produce yep. you can embrace the seasonality of the place because you've got you know distinctive spring winter summer autumn food that's available, you know, whether it's bluff oysters or white bait or asparagus or wild mushrooms, all these sort of things, you know, you can sort of lean into and really, you know, reap the rewards of having access to seasonality, you know, like it's, you know, in the big cities when you order stuff, it just arrives, your problem will come with boxes, you know, in a place like this, you get to, you, you know, the people that are growing, the tomato, you know, the people that are growing the basil, yeah, and yeah. It's, you know, or the, or the mushrooms, or you get to have personal relationships with the fishermen, stuff that you can't do in the big cities because they're just physically, you know, like the physical constraints prohibit that. 
So it gives you a really unique opportunity to to feel like really, you know, that you're you know that you're part of the part of the community, you know, the food production side of it as well, not just cooking it. You know, and you can be specific. You can say to guys, "Look, can you grow me those red tomatoes or the or the you know the ones that ripen but stay green because I want them for a salad, whatever." You know, and mm. you could have that establish that dialogue with different farmers and stuff. It's so cool. You know, I mean, I knew the guy, you know, that that used to grow our lamb down at the Catlins and. You know, the fishermen that used to fish off the, you know, the coast of Southland and he'd say, oh, green bone wrong today or got these, oh, there was one guy that just used to catch flounder for me at Blue Cliffs, oh. you know. So that sort of stuff was absolutely okay. extraordinary, you know. Yeah. But it's good to go away and to see what other people are doing and to come back and bring brush strokes of different sorts of cuisines, you know. I've, I've worked in India once at the Taj Palace and came back and started using a lot of those flavour profiles in our food and... You know, equally, you'd come back from France, maybe, and you know, whatever. You you know, you just you've got to be open to it because I think that way you evolve as a. You don't want to be stuck in a routine of just cooking the same stuff. Same all the stuff. Time. I mean, yeah. I have my favourite dishes, but you really want to be open to the experiences that you sort of you know that you subject yourself to because then you can then it feels as though your product's not static because then your clients don't get bored. What I what I learned. You know, and, and I've studied this a lot, but what I learnt with my clients is they want two things. Mm. They want sameness and they want change, both at the same time. <laughs> they want to come in and know they can get that trio of curries, mm. but they also want to know that there's a special on that they probably have never seen before. You know, whether that's a jellyfish salad or whatever. Mm. But, you know, so you want, to, you want to balance the two, and I found that was always the juggle. That was, and it keeps your staff interested too, because, I mean, chefs are creatives. And so, you know, if you shoot them in the foot and go, we're just going to run the same menu. And I know people that do that and good on them, you know, but it's not yeah. how I, I like to work because I, I like to keep my creative people stimulated. And the only way you're going to do that is to give them new things to create. Otherwise, well, it becomes repetition. And, of course, of course you know? it is. It's common sense, isn't it? But it is funny how I suppose people are, you know, very stuck in their ways and, and maybe maybe some type of person likes that personally i wouldn't i prefer especially when you live in a small place because you you want to be excited by by new things and if you just if you're just going to the it's it's very tedious after a while isn't it the same old same old offerings yeah i mean for both parties isn't it really you know i mean unless you're living i mean it depends on why you're in restaurants i mean if like I'm a chef owner, so for me it was always the creative process was part of the appeal of being in it and and i just you know like I just couldn't bear the thought of not having that involved as part of it. But equally, you know, like I know people that just treat, there's a, there's a multitude of guys in Queenstown that, or, or there have been in the past, that just treat the the restaurant thing as a business. And they go, and they think, well, we're aimed at the tourist market, so we're never going to see them again, or maybe not till next year. Mm. You know, so we can afford to not have that. And it makes, I guess from a business point of view, it's much easier to conduct because, you know, you can just, you know what your food costs are, you know you're going to use, you know, this many grams of that and that many grams of that. You know, you can absolutely have it down tight like that. And, and, and it makes good sense, I guess, but it just takes creativity out of the equation. And that is just not why I'm in it. And, and, and frankly, most of the, the good chefs I know, you know, are similarly motivated. I mean, look at what Bourne's doing out of Amistad. You know, he's making his mm. power sausage and just really unique, world-class stuff, you know, but he's got a crew of guys there. Got a, you know, some high horsepower in that kitchen. Lots of Michelin guys, you know, that have had, you know, experience in some of the best restaurants in the world, but they all mm. are stimulated by the creative process there. You know? Yeah, no, very true. And, and, and let's face it, a, a, a chef is a creative 100%. I mean, every night you're in that kitchen, it's like a performance, it's like a show, and you have to dig deep sometimes to bring out the best. So it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting life, isn't it? Hey, you, we've got to talk about Glen Orkey because, and, and just in case you've just tuned in, by the way, we're talking yes. with Pete Gavron, a uh, renowned chef who is, who's got a, a new uh, project while well, he's been, been there a wee while uh, at the Headwaters Lodge. Just uh, tell us about that, Pete. Okay. Yeah, that's an amazing thing. Uh, I think it sails under the radar because the guys that are involved in it are s sort of, they embrace humility to the point that they haven't actually perhaps marketed it to the extent that they could have if they mm -hmm. were more sort of, you know, into banging their own drum. But it's Debbie and Paul Brainerd, who uh, he is an American chap and he used to, he is sort of a contemporary of um, Steve Jobs and Gates and those guys. Like they were the people he was hanging out with. Apparently, I think he was the editor of the New York Times back in the 80s. Mm. And uh, he, in, 
he developed, you know, desktop publishing and he um, created Adobe, you know, the company. Yeah, incredible. And sold um, for, for a vast fortune. And then he spent, as far as I can gather, the rest of his life being involved in philanthropic projects. They opened a place in Seattle called Islandwood. I think it was a 100-acre spread where they used really quite, you know, um, revolutionary educational sort of models aimed at a lower decile area and the kids all flourished and became, you know, successful in, you know, different fields. And mm. so they came to, they came here on a holiday and I, as, as the story goes, they were driving in, in, into Glenorchy and Debbie sort of looked over her shoulder and went, that place that's talking to me, mm. pointing at the camping ground. You know, mm. She just got a feel for it. And, mm. you know, as places, to, you know, can grab you like that, I guess. And so they turned it into the biggest... Uh, eco lodge of its kind in the world and they developed it at great expense and they formed a trust and they have um, put this development into the into a trust and the beneficiaries of the trust are the kids in the local community you know which is such an extraordinary thing and uh, as I said to you earlier mm. Leanne, you know like you know you know Paul brain is sort of the guy that drives around in an old Toyota and, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, but he, but, he, you know, he's, he has the vision to sort of create, a, you know, a, a project like this mm. and it's just pure philanthropy. You know, mm. they don't have an agenda. They, don't, they certainly don't have a financial agenda for, for themselves. They, they want this to work so that they can benefit the community. And yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just pure philanthropy and giving back, um, hey, I think, yeah. Totally, you know. I mean, he's yeah. I mean, it's just an it's an opportunity for New Zealand to support something like this, what they've created, you know. And every dollar spent there, every dollar of profit goes into the community to benefit the kids in the school. So, um, I think yeah, that's a really noble cause. And it and and as a consequence of that, they've got a lot of people that work there that are involved with the project mm. that see that and are driven by that too. You know, there's. There are a lot of the staff there, you know, realise what a, what an extraordinary gesture that is, you know, and it's sort of, it's just altruism. So It is a special um, place. I don't think people, if you haven't been there, Pete, it's it's mind-blowing when you walk in, and isn't it? I mean, the whole layout oh, I mean, like, is as incredible. Far as, as far as, the, you know, like the physical property goes, it's one of the most beautiful restaurants in New Zealand. I say that with... Out reservation. In fact, it's one of the most beautiful restaurants I've seen in my life. I think it really is. It's you know, Warwick Weber was the engi- the chief engineer on the job, and he's just created an extraordinarily beautiful structure there. And then Debbie sort of did the interior finishes on it with her, it, you know, beautiful eye. So, oh, yeah. so if you walk in there, it's a jaw dropper. I mean, but yeah, it, it, a lot of people that live in Queensland that haven't been out there wouldn't appreciate just what a masterpiece of this of architecture oh, it's and design. Stunning. Yeah, it's and cool. of course the you fact know. that it's what the most sustainable uh, complex, I think, in the southern hemisphere, if not the world, in terms of all of the special features because no money was spared to, to make it that way and to make it green. And, and it, it so works, hey? You know, we've got stuff like we, we aim ultimately to be sort of completely self-sustainable. We've got a glass house, the only one of its kind in in the country, you know, that was brought over from the States. And it's got a, you know, it's like a triple glaze and it uses geothermal heating. And, you know, they can grow, you know, watermelons in the wintertime in this thing. So, um, you know, we've got lots of these raised garden beds out there. We sort of dipped our toes into it last year, but this summer we'll, we'll be in a situation where at least for most of the summer we'll be able to be self-sufficient as far as sort of, you know, the, you know, the vegetables and greens go. Yeah, really cool. And that's, that's no mean feat in that part of the world. Oh, no. But um, it's interesting, hey, because you've got Araha not far down the road, uh, the, the brilliant, um, well, I guess you call it a detox health retreat, and it's and their food, same deal. You know, they're growing stuff there, and it's just wonderful. So we've got to talk about the Headwaters Lodge because you've been doing, you know, putting on um, events uh, where, where you create this incredible meal and, and, and there's packages been available just to, to dine and stay. Will you be doing that again uh, this summer? Yeah, yeah. We sort of reopen um, in a couple of weeks and, um, yeah, it's sort of the... We've got a... Our liquor licences have just gone through. 
So we'll be able to provide, um, you know, wine to people that are not in-house um, mm. and food. Mm. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's basically just open to the general public. Yeah. Yeah, so you just need to go online if anyone's listening and they're interested. Uh, and I guess just look up Camp Glenorchy and, and the Headwaters uh, Lodge. And, oh, I mean, we, what did we do? You had a special screening last year of a movie and, and a dinner created by Pete, and it was just, and we stayed overnight. It was one of the loveliest uh, things to do and just a very special kind of, uh, well, 24 hours away. And you felt like, the thing about this particular place, Pete, isn't it, is you feel like, you are, I don't know, you could be anywhere, far away from Queenstown. It's a retreat, isn't it? It feels like, it, you know, it's, 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 you know, it, it's time out, you know, from, for, you know, from a busy schedule for anyone that needs a bit of, you know, like it's, yeah, as you said, I mean, you could be, you could be anywhere overseas, but you, you know, you're in, in, uh, in, in GY. In GY, and, um, <laughs> beautiful GY. It's, uh, Oh, the beautiful thing, indeed. You know, you can walk the route burn or, you know, or any of the tracks around there. And it's, you know, you really feel like you're at the entrance to Fiordland out there. You know, it's it's the gateway to Fiordland. And, the, and the, you know, the, the sort of ecosystems are just so beautiful out there. Yeah. But what we do with the food, it's not like a conventional restaurant where you sit down and get a menu and, you know, like the people that work on the floor there being, you know, the wait staff, they've all got other interests like they're, you know, they're, they're mountain guides or, you know, heli or whatever. They, they, they're they multitaskers. But the vibe is, once again, I sort of go back to that thing of it feeling like a dinner party, you know, like it's shared plates. People come in and, if, you know, and they get what's what we're cooking for dinner that night, which is what's in season, whether it's fish that's just been locally caught or... You know, a lot of, I, as much as I can, I, I lean into organics and, um, and people, it, it, and there's always a, there's always a vegan option for dinner, but, you know, largely it's sort of, it's, you know, come in, make yourselves at home and, um, and, and basically join the party. Yeah. So it's quite, in, the whole thing's quite interactive. You it's, know. A, it's, inf um, it's informal, but, but said, the setting's divine, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there's extraordinary artwork and um, even the floors have got these um, stones inlaid into them that are representative of the different rivers, the Dart and the Greenstone and all of that. I mean, it's just, it's sort of, yeah, it's like a huge sculpture. And there are mm. great sculptures by Dan Kelly outside. There's, there, there, are, there are sort of sculptures that sort of are activated when it rains and there's an outside sort of barbecue area and there's, the thing about it is it's just not one dining room. I mean, there's a place that can be used for conferences that seats 100 people, mm. you know, that's got this super high-tech sort of audio, you know, um, screen thing set up. Yeah. But, there's, you know, there's, there's a, there's, well, there are several different dining rooms that, you know, that, that have got sort of different moods to them. There's one that's very sunny. Mm. There's, there's an outside sort of barbecue area with a couple of different sort of uh, hot plates that are all activated from the powered by the solar farm that they've got out there mm. Um, mm. it is it's like it's yeah, like it's really quite extraordinary thing. it is extraordinary and, and it is something for everyone and you could i mean you could dance in that room you know the room you, you mentioned the you know you could if you had a, a small group and say you'd been having a dinner and i don't know you could have this scope for so much there for for i suppose musicians you know outside perhaps on a summer's evening i mean it's we're, we're moving into we're moving into Sunday brunches. We had one just to see how it went actually, and it and it, it was great. It was really successful. The vibe was great. You know, we intend to sort of continue that into summer. I'll keep you posted on that. But we'll have live music. That's part of the thing, you know. And mm, good. And it'll be a great way to spend a Sunday afternoon if you're based in Queensland, just to sort of you know oh. shimmy out there, drive up there. It's because it's a stunning. The other thing is it's a stunning drive. Stunning to get there. drive. I was talking to. To, to uh, Mr. Hubbard, you know, from the, uh, you know, Hubbard Cereals, who's got a house out that way. And he was saying, I've ridden my bike all around the world. You know, he does that, you know. Dick Hubbard loves riding his bike. He's ridden, a, you know, across South America and across the States and through Russia and China. He's just done all of these incredible long journeys on his, on his big <laughs> yeah. BMW. Yeah. And he was saying, you know, but for, he said, I've travelled the world on my bike, but that road between, between Queenstown 
and Glen Orkey is the best short ride in the world, I reckon. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's a good call coming from you because that's what you do. He's well-travelled. <laughs> totally. I don't know anyone. No, show me someone else has ridden their bike more across more countries, more continents than Dick Hubbard. When you say a bike, you mean a motorbike, car. don't you? Uh, BMW. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. It's not a, yeah. He's not on a bicycle. So <laughs> <laughs> Halfway through the Amazon now, if he was doing that. No, so he's got the big BMW sort of, you know, one of those bikes that does both off road, on road. But oh, yeah, like fantastic. A God. One of those things. All powered by Berry Berry Nice. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we uh, used to love that. Over the years. Honestly, the, the, totally, yeah, yeah. the yogurt, the yogurt raisins, and also used to write silly stuff on the packets of the cereal, which was actually. Quite, right. quite fun. No, he's 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 a legendary chap, and he, he deserves uh, you know his his success, and he's done well. So didn't he revolutionise the cereal industry in New Zealand? There was no, I mean, he came along, and it was like the bench, you know, gold standard for cereal was Dick Hubbard's cereal when it came out. Mm. But my daughter always used to take those yogurt cup, you know, yeah. covered things out of the packet when she was little. Oh, she didn't and, like uh, those. No, she ate them. Yeah, and, we used to. Because everyone else in the family loves it too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, day one, open, gone. All of the little yogurt. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we might have been guilty of that too, yeah. too, when we were kids, but <laughs> everyone remembered it, you know. And and so, okay, so that's the Headwaters, which is just a, a lovely um, a lovely project. And, you know, particularly now as the weather warms up and everything. But, you know, we've been talking a lot. Let's get to the serious issue now, Pete, even though it's been, it's, we've had lots of fun in the chat. But, y- you know, uh, we all know Queensland's in a hospo crisis and there's no one to cook. Cool. Pretty, lots of things and many restaurants struggling. So what did you think about that uh, that story about the new um, accredited employer work visa? In the regions today, yeah, it's a sticky one, isn't it? You know, mm. like... Uh, <laughs> I know a lot of people in the industry now, you know, I've been in it 45 years and I, and it's not just New Zealand, frankly, you know, I mean, I think when I was in London after I left Morocco, people were talking about the same thing. It's as though COVID caused this sort of precipitation of like people leaving the industry and maybe, I, I, and I don't know what it is, but you know, people are saying it in London, they're saying it in Australia as well, but, mm. but certainly we, we're stuck here and, and our draw card is that we can attract people to come here and do that sort of work because there's other things to do, like, you know, come to New Zealand and be a chef. You can also go skiing, you know, and yeah. and that was always that big draw card. We would always get people over here in the winter months, and it just seems as though the bar has been raised to a point now where it's inaccessible. And there was one thing I just thought was extraordinary today, and I, I read this. This is, this is care of the ODT, so mm. I have to, you know, work on the premise that they did their research correctly here. But what they said was they had a cha- – well, there was one Queenstown employer who had a chap – that had come over wanting a job. He had a decade of industry experience, including three years at culinary school. Uh, he worked internationally. Um, after graduating at his culinary school, he started in the industry as a cook. He'd taken on three positions as a common chef, that's like a junior chef, then a demi chef de party, which means you, you know, someone who's just on the, just about to rock, you know, on the take verge. over their own yeah. little section in the kitchen, yeah. Mm-hmm. And since then, had since 1920, had been a chef to party at two different highly regarded overseas hotels. So that's 10 years' experience. And he'd gotten knocked back <laughs> for his, uh, you know, application as a chef because he didn't have the, they said, the equivalent of cookery level number four, um, which is really just a year's course in New Zealand anyway. So I just see there's a real disconnect between what the industry needs and what the government's giving them at the moment and whether the government has got an agenda of its own and wants to reset, you know, the tourist industry over here, I don't know. But that's what's going to happen if they don't loosen things up. People need staff. And I know, I don't want to name anyone in particular, but I know some big operators out here who have got hundreds of staff who are saying that they have to close. And this is after, you know, a two-year drought as a result of COVID. People have had to close their, their restaurants. Finally, they have an opportunity to inject some capital back into their business and they have to close two days a week because they don't have the staff to effectively run their businesses. So, I mean, that's a big problem and I think the government should be here front and centre addressing that. There should should be more dialogue with people. They should be coming down here and speaking to people that own restaurants and hotels and ask them direct. I don't think there's been enough dialogue and, and, and certainly... 
there, there certainly is, hasn't been enough clarity about the, what the real needs are for people in the hospital. My heart goes out to them. I mean, you know, they have gone yeah. two years post-COVID, or, or during COVID, and not being able to trade because, well, for, you know, for good reason, I believe, too. You know, now that things have, you know, have, you know, gone back to some sort of normalcy, they can't get people through the door because they can't employ the people they need. Mm. You know, and people mm. are being sh- are shooed or shunted away, people with qualifications, because the bar is raised, or, you know, just, you know, at an excessively high point. Mm. It's not cool. I mean, it's not good for our industry. And not. everyone in Queenstown, one way or another, whether, you, you know, whether you're, you know, you're running a medical practice or a restaurant or, or you know, or you're a plumber, whatever, everyone in some way or another is affected by tourism. Yeah, true, true. You know, w- w- because th- that's the lifeblood of this, of this community. That's what, that's what this town was founded on. Mm. And, um, and I think that they need more, I just think they need more support with this. And it just seems like it's such an obvious thing, like let them get more help let you know make it accessible yeah offer an inducement whatever let you know get you know government could offer an inducement i don't i'm not quite sure how that would work but Mm. you know let's stimulate you know the desire of young chefs to come here and work because there is work there's lots of work yeah there's you know people aren't shy of paying either no you know so It's it's interesting because yeah. we had the well, Lone, think- Lone Stars um, Dave Gardner on early in the week, uh, Pete, and he he was you I know did. yeah and he, he he was great, but he said you know honestly he's having to borrow chefs and and things like that, and uh, he said it's heartbreaking and it's kind of hour by hour, and he said the same thing about about getting um, a, 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 some government representative to perhaps stand in their shoes for a night or two. Who's down here? Like who who's actually seeing this firsthand? They don't. It feels yeah. like no one really cares. So no one's gone into a restaurant and been there for a couple of nights and seen tourists come in and and they're begging to have dinner somewhere because they no one is open or or they just haven't got the staff to cater for them or blah 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 whatever. It's actually really hard to to, to book a restaurant now anywhere in, in Queenstown because there's oh, <laughs> they're all shut. If I get a table on a Monday night, everyone's shut. Um, but even weekends now as well. That's a really interesting point, Leanne. I mean. You know, you've got, it, it just feels as though there's this massive disconnect between, you know, government policy and the guys on the ground. And as you said, like, come and watch this, actually experience it firsthand, because otherwise it's just all theoretical and you can just go off and tangents and, but it's just, there's such a disconnect from the, you know, between the real world yeah. and what's happening. Here. Yeah. Um, so what's the future? And what 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 do we got to? What's going to happen <laughs> to our to our hospo? You know what's going to happen to these restaurants? Will will they will they just end up closing? Okay, I saw it. someone someone contacted me yesterday and said, you know, there's a restaurant in Cromwell, five years left on the lease, uh, fully equipped kitchen is thirty square meters and a fully equipped kitchen, twenty five grand for the business. Hey, wow! And I thought that's what's going to happen. I mean, that's a giveaway. That's someone just going, just take this off my hands. That's basically mm. a free restaurant, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and I thought, well, that's a good opportunity for someone, I suspect. But, um, yeah. but tragic for the person that's in the situation for that, you know, to, you know, to, to be forced to do that, mm. whether it's through their own burnout or, you mm. know. And that's the thing I see um, people, you know, like there's a bit of a sense of despair amongst some hospital people because they're wondering exactly what you just asked. Like, where does this go? You know, do we get what happens next to you? You know, I mean, and the thing is, if you, if you, people always aspire to serve, you know, to do the best they could in, in this industry, in this town. And if you keep removing the, you know, the moving parts from it, if you, if you take the, you know, the people, you know, the, the staff out of the equation, well, then that trickles down to the client's experience too. People don't have to come here. No. You know, they, they work under the assumption that they're going to get something you know, enjoyable and, you know, I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. If it's, you, a, it's a big question. Well, a part of a part of the whole thing, particularly, okay, imagine you're perhaps an Australian family and you're here right now, you're having a brilliant ski holiday and you want to, and you've got quite young kids, so you kind of want a family vibe. So I suppose, you know, you might want to go to the cow for some pasta or whatever, you know, or, or the Lone Star or something like that, you know, um, kind of... Um, you know, cheerful and fun and keeping up with the holiday vibe and you, and you can't get in. And so, and the next night, you're having the same issues again and the next night, because you do eat out a lot when you go away. It's, um, yeah, it's depressing and it's not, it's not great. Not good for the town and not good for what people's perspective of what we can offer. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, we had an, ob- you know, an obligation to... And it was all going so well, too, you know. There was just... <laughs> yes. It was getting so much traction. Um, getting back to, to the, the, you know, the, the, the family from Australia, that's one thing about Glen Orkey I'd like to add, too, is that they're totally kid-friendly and dog-friendly. Like, they have, you know, you can... You know, you can bring your pets. That's true. Kind of cool. That's a big plus for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great thing. So, and, you know, this is the thing, Pete. I think, you know, just scratch the surface. Perhaps go stay in different areas. Uh, you know, you don't have to stay right in the heart of Queenstown. Uh, there's plenty uh, available, but you're right. And I don't want to end the interview. We're coming close to news, and I, I want to end it on a great note because it's been such a good chat. And I think... The the the, the, the yeah. camp yeah the camp uh, G Y um, experience is is like nothing else and also the other thing is it's super warm the rooms are incredibly inviting and you're never cold the, just because it's no, sustainable that's, so that's the other thing you know thermal warm I mean heating it's just uh, like the technology is is extraordinary there's nothing quite like, I, I think it really is the biggest eco lodge of its kind in the world that is 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 carbon zero. You know, so they've got this huge solar farm. They put power back into the grid mm. on occasion. Mm. It's amazing, so, isn't I mean, it? Really sort of, <laughs> and the other option, I mean, if you want to commute, is you could, you could, you can, you could hire a boat. If there's a group, you know, you can hire one of the, you know, the Wayfarer group boats, and and you know, get taken up to the, you know, the pier at GY, and then get yeah. shuttled down into. There's all sorts of corporate options there for people that if they want to do a big group. You know, they can book out the place, and you know, you get, you get, uh, you know. Uh, you know, a beautiful hot breakfast oh, spread, and yeah. then um, you know, there's so many different options. But the boat idea, yeah. a wonderful idea, actually. It's it's a an amazing trip, you know, doing that from Queenstown to GY and 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 back. Really cool. Let's use our lake. Hey, you know what? We've talked up the whole hour. Crazy. <laughs> Have we? Yeah. Okay. And it, hasn't hey, it been wonderful? Chat. Yeah. Will you come back again sometime, Pete? Sure. Why not? Hey, good, look, good lovely on chat. You. Always a pleasure to hear your voice. It was brilliant. Right. <laughs> look forward to seeing Ciao. you soon. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Pete Gavron on uh, South Beat. Uh, what a great chat that was.